A tiny island community torn apart by a murder mystery that's remained unsolved for more than three decades. In 1986, on Phillip Island in Victoria, a young woman is brutally killed, the letter A carved into her body. For its residents and a place better known for its playful penguins, it is a disturbing event. The victim is Beth Barnard, the young mistress of one of the island's most prominent and wealthy family members, Fergus Cameron. It's the most brutal attack I've ever seen. The prime suspect is Fergus Cameron's wife, Vivian. Her whole world is starting to collapse. What future is there for her? But Vivian Cameron has never been seen since the night of the attack. She'd made up her mind, this is what I've got to do. The community has remained divided and asking, where is Vivian? Did she stage her own disappearance or is she dead? And importantly, is she even the killer? The brutality of this, could a woman do that? Tonight, our experts look at the evidence. Now that's a lie. At that point in time, she was up to something. We'll review the police investigation and re-examine what happened that terrible night on Phillip Island. Do we have definitive proof that Vivian did commit suicide? No. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, Gary Jubelin, a 30-year veteran of the New South Wales Police Force and one of Australia's most celebrated homicide detectives. Dr Sarah Yule, forensic psychologist who's worked on some of Australia's worst crimes over the past 20 years. And in Melbourne, Valentine Smith, former senior Victoria police detective and now CEO of My Pernet, Missing Person Investigations. Vicky Petratus, best-selling true crime author whose podcast on the Phillip Island murder is based on three decades' research. And Rory O'Connor, retired detective senior sergeant who was brought in to help investigate the Phillip Island murder. Rory, you investigated this. Why is this case still being talked about? Well, we never were able to locate a body uh, of the person we believe committed the murder. When there's no body, it's, uh, it can't be closed. Valentine, you're the missing persons expert. Uh, what do you think is the reason we're still baffled by this crime? It's such a intriguing crime. It involves adultery, murder, mayhem, and total chaos. It's worthy of Shakespeare. And Vicky, I think in your opinion, this is a crime far from resolved. Yes, I, I think people need to find justice in this. Two women died and we just don't know the answer. Here we go then, the final lap of the Australian Grand Prix in the slipstream comes by Marquez. To most He's Australians, Phillip Island is famous for its Grand Prix track fast motorbikes and faster supercars. Got the line together and, they... and its iconic penguin colony, the largest of its kind in the world. But in the early hours of September 23rd, 1986, the island was the scene of one of Victoria's most horrific crimes when vivacious and very popular local 23-year-old Beth Barnard was viciously murdered. Elizabeth Barnard's body was found in the bedroom of her farmhouse at Rill near Cars by a friend at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. Beth was in a secret relationship with 36-year-old Fergus Cameron, a member of the island's high-profile Cameron family and owners of the Grand Prix land. Police believe Fergus's wife, Vivian, having found out about her husband's affair, stabbed him with a broken glass and then drove to his lover's house in a murderous rage and brutally killed her. As a final indignity, Vivian, police believe, then carved the letter A for adulteress into Beth's chest. It's 
It's alleged Vivian fled the scene, drove home to collect her handbag, then to the island's San Remo Bridge, from which it's believed she decided to jump. On the face of it, an open and shut case. A scorned woman driven by revenge and rage to murder, then suicide. But not everything about this case is so open and shut. There's a trail that's uh, led from the murder of Beth. We, we can lock that in. We know Beth has been murdered. The suspect, we know, is Vivian. The loose end is that we haven't had the opportunity of speaking to Vivian, whether we've recovered her body or she's gone on the run, we don't know. After three decades examining the case, author Vicky Petratus decided in her absence, Vivian should be given a voice. And that's because she believes there are just too many question marks to assume Vivian's guilt. Vicky, what are the standout bits for you that just don't make sense? I think the brutality of this, once you look at the crime scene photos, and you always look at it through the lens of, could a woman do that? I'm really interested in the psychology of this. And what I want to know is, rather than what motivates a person, I want to know what sets off the trigger. What makes the mind detonate? In 1986, Phillip Island had just 4,000 residents, a small and tight-knit community that to outsiders might appear to be closed, even secretive. One of those outsiders was Vivian Candy, who'd married Fergus Cameron and moved with him to the island 10 years before. Fergus was definitely an insider, a member of the Cameron clan, the island's most prominent family, whom author Vicky Petratus found didn't want her poking around their lives. People will describe them as royalty. I've never seen anything like the kind of influence. Like the minute I went to the island and I walked into the newspaper office to do a newspaper search and the editor came out and said, I've just rang the family. They don't want you to do it. Off you go. Sue Chadwick, who lives on Phillip Island and worked with Vivian at the local community centre, says Fergus Cameron's new wife struggled to fit in. I think the Cameron family were well known and important in the community as a farming family. Vivian enjoyed the people that she met outside of that environment. I think she was a little bit different to the rest of the family. She, she was a little bit more um, elite. According to Sue, while Vivian embraced her work at the community centre, it was always known her children came first. Vivian had already felt the bitter experience of life in a fractured family. She was just eight when her father left for a younger lover. She adored her sons. She was a good mother. I believe she was a good wife, too. In his spare time, Fergus Cameron worked at the Penguin Parade, one of the island's major tourist attractions, and it was where he met the bubbly 21-year-old Beth Barnard. Four months later, Fergus employed Beth as a farmhand on the Cameron family property. And by May 1985, their affair had begun. We did know that Beth worked for them. We know that Beth was uh, a popular person down at the uh, Penguin Parade. Though I think uh, Vivian had known about that affair. She was at her wit's end, I think. According to her friend Sue Chadwick, Vivian seemed increasingly concerned about her marriage. Did you notice Vivian change at all? Yes, she did. She, she lost weight and um, she, she dressed a little bit differently. And I was told by a friend that she was doing that to save her marriage, try and save her marriage. The 
Sarah is obviously becoming known, that would be wearing on Vivian. Oh, I think we could, yes, very reasonably conclude that that would have been an ongoing source of stress or distress. Not only is she looking at um, the failure of her relationship and, and the breakdown of her family, and so she may have struggled for quite a long period of time to, to keep that together, but especially with the Cameron family being quite high profile in this island community, that may have exacerbated it as well. Liz, I'm starting to see a picture here to build Vivian up, that her whole world is starting to collapse. A 35, 36-year-old woman, and she's got the two boys who are the love of her life. A marriage is on the rocks. A husband is in a relationship with a younger woman. And what, what future? What future is there for her? It's Philip Island in Victoria, late September, 1986. Hanging on a thread. I hold on to Vivian Cameron's marriage to wealthy local farmer Fergus Cameron is on the rocks. She knows he's having an affair with 23-year-old Beth Barnard. This is a time-old story, isn't it? This, this happens to thousands of women every day. According to Fergus, his affair with Beth continued for 16 months. On Monday, September the 22nd, 1986, at around 9 p.m., Fergus arrives home late after being with Beth. They argue, and Fergus admits he's been to see Beth. According to his police statement, Fergus says Vivian became verbally and physically abusive, striking him with a wine glass cutting his ear and back. But Vicky Petratus, who studied the case for 30 years, wonders whether it actually happened that way, given Vivian's account of the night has never been heard. I think we always have to be really careful when we only have one account. They definitely attended the hospital and definitely Fergus had injuries, but they never said how it happened. And no glass was ever located. And I remember interviewing uh, the crime scene examiner and he said, we didn't find any broken glass. Yeah, Rory, you say that there was glass found at the scene at the home? I'm sure that the glass that was found at the house was uh, taken by forensics, and I'm sure that it was Fergus's blood on that. That's not in the analysis at all. When I interviewed the crime scene examiner, he said he didn't find blood. There's no analysis. It's one of the many aspects of this case that Vicky Petratus will take issue with. And medical staff at the hospital where Vivian took Fergus for treatment that night reported the couple appeared very much together and that Vivian was concerned for Fergus. The nurse who looked after them, I think she did notice that closeness and she said, oh, I thought he might have had a fight with one of his brothers because she couldn't fathom that it could have been with Vivian. Before leaving for the hospital, Vivian called Fergus's sister Marnie and asked her to mind their two sons. When Marnie arrived at the house, she says she saw signs of a struggle. Inside, there was a pile of bloodied clothes and towels and blood-stained tissues in the bathroom. So let's just accept what we've got. We've got a person that's got injuries presenting himself to the hospital, um, injuries that he couldn't sustain himself, in company with his wife on the day that uh, there was discussion had about um, him having an affair. So I think if you put all that in together, you can accept that uh, there's been an act of violence But in the are you thinking to yourself in the back of your mind, this woman has been physically aggressive before? Yes, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say because of someone's been involved in a domestic it would necessarily lead to a murder. If she was going to kill, though, later in the night, why didn't she just kill Fergus? She's angry. Why didn't she kill him? Well, and I suppose a, a lot of times when um, the perpetrator of a murder is female, a lot of times it is the intimate um, partner um, in a relationship. But... I've also seen many times, in this kind of scenario where there is another party involved as well, their, their aggression and their emotion quite often is towards that other party. Fergus and Vivian come home from the hospital at around midnight. 
According to his later police statement, Fergus claimed he and Vivian agreed to end their marriage, that Vivian would give up her children, and that she accepted Beth Barnard would be his new partner. Fergus also stated Vivian told him she would leave the following day and start a new life without her young sons in Melbourne. It's something Vivian's close friend, Sue Chadwick, finds hard to believe. Would she have left her children behind as no. was stated? No, no, no way, no way. She was devoted to them. No way could I imagine the Vivian I know saying, you have the children, I'll go, you can have a divorce, Beth can be your partner. No, no, the Vivian I know would not have done that. This is the bit, uh, Sarah, that trips up a lot of people. Can you understand that? From what we know about Vivian, I can understand that that would be the case, that she wouldn't um, want to leave her children. I would have great difficulty with a scenario in which she is willingly giving up custody um, to Fergus of, of her children. Um, I think from what we know of Vivian, that's highly unlikely. Vivian's cherished marriage had been slipping from her grasp for months as Fergus's affair continued. She'd fought hard to keep her family together, something that was important after growing up in a broken home after her father left for another woman. But now it seemed all that was in vain. You can see signs, Valentine, of Vivian's emotional state are starting to um, change, I guess. It would have to. Yes, Liz. Yes, Liz. I think, I think we're getting there now. She was very focused and very uh, family-oriented towards the two boys. Uh, now we've got humiliation. Vicky, do you think that Vivian was capable of walking away from those children based on your research? Not based on my research at all. And that was just the consistent picture, according to all of her friends. And you heard Sue Chadwick, you know, she would never leave those children. They were really precious. And that's one thing that Fergus repeats in his statement, that when she says, I'm going to leave and I'm going to leave those children with you because you're a great father and I'm not a good mother, that's another thing that her friends sort of say, no way. The accuracy of this alleged conversation is reliant on Fergus Cameron's memory, who gave his version of events in the traumatic wake of his lover's murder and the public exposure of his affair. Well, I think going back to the standing that the Cameron family had within the community, the embarrassment of uh, the situation that uh, I can imagine him downplaying it. Yes, I was having an affair, but uh, we've come to an amicable arrangement that we're going to separate and explain it that way. It sort of diminishes the trauma of what his actions have, have caused. So you give him a little benefit of the doubt? You, there, there's a room for, let's call it error, whether it's deliberate or not, but there's room for, that's, that's the white noise around an investigation. You've got to focus on what are the key points of the investigation. It's now around 1 a.m. And again, according to Fergus Cameron's police statement, Vivian appears more resigned than angry, accepting her marriage is over and that she will give him custody of her beloved sons. She drives Fergus to stay with his sister, Marnie. The two boys are again left sleeping at home. Fergus and Marnie see Vivian drive away. It is the last time anyone will see her. But at 3 a.m., Vivian makes a strange telephone call to a family friend, Robin Dixon, saying she's at the hospital and asks Robin to mind her sons overnight. But wherever Vivian is, she is not at the hospital. To the two homicide detectives at our table, Vivian's call marks a critical moment. The significant thing at the 3am phone call is that she's telling Robin Dixon she's going to the hospital. Now, that's a lie. At that point in time, she had formed some sort of intent at 3am, so she was up to something. That's when she'd made up her mind, this, this is what I've got to do. So in your opinion, her intent at that point, at that 3am call, was that she was going to 
murder. Death. I've got no doubt whatsoever about that aspect of it. But Vicky Petratus, who has dug deeply into this case, is not convinced. Could there be another explanation? It was interesting, Gary said um, when Vivian makes that call, she lies, and that's to cover up, uh, you know, an, an intent or a plan. Maybe she, when she got home, she was upset, and maybe she wanted to get away. Fergus Cameron tells police he and his wife Vivian have had a violent showdown. Their marriage is over and Fergus has a lover, 23-year-old Beth Barnard. Vivian phones a friend at three in the morning, telling her she's at the hospital and asking her to pick up her children for the night. According to police, it's an alibi for murder. Sometime in those early hours of Tuesday, September 23rd, 1986, Beth Barnard is viciously attacked. It seems Beth, barely out of bed, is taken by surprise. In the stabbing frenzy that followed, Beth's throat is cut. A tooth is knocked out. Blood is smeared across her body. And shockingly, the letter A is carved into her torso. A bloodied knife is left by Beth's side. And when it was all over, the killer covers her body with a doona. And in what might have been a moment of reflection, there is evidence the killer smoked at least one cigarette before leaving. Well, Melbourne's Homicide Squad is called to the scene and lead detective on the case is Rory O'Connor. Uh, what did you think when you walked into that room? A uh, horrific zone. It really was, when you consider the damage that was done to the woman's body. And what kind of killer did you think you were looking at here? Um, well, definitely it was more than you'd think a woman would have done to another woman. Um, and why do you say that? Well, it's the most brutal attack I've ever seen. And uh, I've seen attacks on uh, that men do to men, but this, this was um, horrific for uh, a woman doing it to another woman. It's almost like I'm seeing a very masculine male killing as opposed to a female killing. Catherine Whiteley is an Australian criminologist based in America and a world-renowned expert on women who kill. She's looked at the case and has doubts that Vivian fits the profile of a murderer. Catherine Whiteley's research backs Rory O'Connor's initial thoughts that it was hard to imagine a woman being so vicious. The actual throat cutting, it's... What I found is that women will do one or the other. Once, you know, if, you, if you're stabbed several times, that's it, I'll walk away. But it was like there's this double approach to brutality. We're not finished with you yet. And having the initial A marked on her body, from my professional perspective, I don't think many women would waste their time doing that. It is that observation that has some suggesting there may be other suspects in this crime. Vicky Petratus, who spent 30 years investigating the case, believes the crime scene points to a killer who was far stronger than Vivian Cameron. Whoever did this, this is a very serious crime scene. It's a crime committed by someone who's powerful. Beth's head had been turned when her throat was cut. There's uh, handprints, there's bruising uh, in the shape of hands on several parts of her body that there's a lot of pressure being forced on her. It is so brutal. Could this 35-year-old mother have inflicted this upon uh, a 23-year-old girl? And there, the same observations made by a legal team in America. Unconvinced Vivian has committed murder, they've set up their own innocence project. 
In the US state of North Carolina, defence attorney Stephanie Williams and her colleague Lauren McCarthy have taken up their own examination of the case. It's the things that I, I'm not sure that we'll ever get. It seems as if there were lots of questions that weren't asked at the time, lots of people who were not interviewed or they were interviewed, made statements, and those statements were completely discounted and thrown away. After reading about this Australian crime, the Americans felt compelled to investigate, in particular, the evidence against Vivian. It felt to me that a chunk of the case was missing was that evidence. What did the crime scene look like? What was there? What wasn't there? What was tested? What wasn't? And if it wasn't tested, why wasn't it tested? It's a crime scene that leads Stephanie and Lauren to seriously question whether Vivian could be the killer. From your opinion, did the attacker seem to take control pretty quickly? Yes. Yes, I think that with the knife wounds on Beth and the marks on the sheets that were on her bed, I think that she was attacked in her bed and that she did not have much of an opportunity to respond to that violence. And the question would have to be, would, would Vivian have had the strength to do that? Right. You don't see her grasping the side of the dresser. You don't see her trying to push her attacker off her. And her straw hat was perfectly hanging there still. There was just nothing to indicate that this attack took place, except she got up, fell on the floor, and then the attack was essentially finished right there. But forensic psychologist Dr. Sarah Yule believes the frenzied attack on Beth suggests a powerful rage and even revenge. I think the brutality of it shows that emotionality behind it, um, which also suggests that they are known um, to, the, to the victim. So that's a passion you're talking about? Yes, yeah, a crime of passion, but there's also the brutality in terms of um, being able to, to cause Beth's death um, quite quickly through the stab wound and also the wounds to the neck. And American defence attorney Stephanie Williams and her colleague Lauren McCarthy agree Beth's killer was not a stranger. What stands out for you at that crime scene? There was the Duna hold up where all of her injuries start and go down, which is significant. It shows some sort of remorse that the killer has or some sort of intimate connection with the victim. So we knew just by looking at the crime scene that it is not a random passerby that did this. This is someone that knew Beth. The Duna coming up is an act of what? <laughs> Potential remorse? It, or... it, it can be an indicator of remorse. We have seen in other cases where, um, you know, horrific acts of violence have been perpetrated, but then the offender has had that remorseful... It, it, it's almost like an act of trying to undo what's just been done. Of all the terrible things done to Beth that night, it was the letter A carved into her torso that shocked most. A message, it appears, left by the killer. I immediately thought a letter A to signify adultery. I think it was always the A that got me. This wasn't just an A, this was, you know, four strikes, one side, five, the other, and one across the middle. So, you know, it was, it was meant and it was meant to show something. You'd been given information about an affair. You knew that Vivian was missing. So did you go into that crime scene believing that Vivian had murdered Beth? Yes, yes, we did. For police, the horrific scene before them was both conflicting and confronting. And there are clues that may also have been the case for the killer. This crime scene is extraordinary on a lot of fronts. Yeah, quite often you come to a crime scene where it's a horrific personal attack, which this feels, and they'll leave the body there to humiliate it. The fact that the doona was pulled up and covering her up is showing they're feeling remorse about it. Smoking a cigarette there, that makes me feel someone's a little bit conflicted about what's happened there or, or taking in what's, what's occurred. Rory, I think there was the DNA on the cigarette uh, was determined, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And whose DNA was it? That was uh, Vivian's DNA. And that places her firmly at the scene? 
unless someone planted it there. 23-year-old Beth Barnard, the lover of prominent Phillip Island farmer Fergus Cameron, is brutally murdered. And Fergus's wife, Vivian, is missing. The community of Phillip Island is about to wake to the most shocking crime in its history. In his police statement, Fergus Cameron says the previous night he left the family home after he and Vivian had agreed to end their marriage. The next morning, the Cameron family noticed the farm Land Cruiser and Vivian are missing. No one is aware Beth has been murdered. But feeling concerned, Fergus asks his brother Donald and his brother-in-law, Ian Cairns, to drive to Beth's house and check on her. That was always really puzzling and he, he never explained why he wouldn't have just hopped in the car um, and, and gone to Beth's place himself. Gary. He has been in a situation where he's uh, been discovered having an affair. That's happened within the, you know, 10 hours or 12 hour time frame. The last thing I think he wants to be, just human nature, is in touch with the girl he was having an affair with. The bigger question for me is, why did they prioritise, all of them prioritised, telling Beth, so they found out Vivian had, had gone missing in the middle of the night, and yet they all prioritise the girlfriend that they just found out about that morning. Let's go and make sure she's okay above the sister-in-law and the wife that they've had for 10 years, and none of them went looking for Vivian. Arriving at Beth's house, Donald and Ian make the shocking discovery of Beth's mutilated body. They don't call Fergus Cameron, but instead drive to the police station, where they apparently struggle to report Beth's death. To not to get to the point straight away and say, something terrible has happened, some would see it as suspicious. But you don't? No, not really. Not because I've spoken to so many people that they just can't say the words. When they found something, it's just, you know, because they, they're in shock too. As word spread of Beth Barnard's murder and Vivian Cameron's disappearance, there are vague reports of a vehicle seen parked near the San Remo Bridge, not far from Beth Barnard's house and Phillip Island's link with the mainland. Police looked to the Cameron family for information and, in particular, Fergus. But there seemed to be less focus on locating Vivian and the missing vehicle. Perhaps I um, put my two bobs worth in here too. I'm sort of trying to sort of picture, picture the resources and the, the people involved in this back in 1986. You've got a, a police station with probably two police officers on duty at the time. Both of them are somehow tied up with the murder scene. So no one's out there to find this vehicle in situ earlier than what it was found, unless it wasn't there. But at what point do you get on the police radio and say, look, keep a lookout for Land Cruiser, here's the registration number, because they got that quite early. Look, I accept that. It, but do you get on the radio, and I'm not saying that they would be out searching, but don't you get on the radio and go, keep a lookout for this vehicle? I, no, I accept that, Vicky. That, that's what you would hope would have been done, and it may have been done, but who's going to respond to that if there are no police resources other than what you've got tied up at the crime scene? I guess the question I always had was that all of the police coming across the bridge, so all of the CIB detectives, they're all coming over the bridge and driving right past that car because it was visible from the bridge. Police believe the location of the Land Cruiser strongly suggests that Vivian has jumped from the bridge. But inside the Land Cruiser, there's a piece of evidence that adds to the mystery. And that's her black handbag found on the front seat. Police were told the bag was seen at Vivian's home by her friend Robin Dixon at around the time it's presumed Beth was murdered. According to any reasonable timeline of the crime, 
For the handbag to be in the Land Cruiser, it meant Vivian left the scene of the murder, drove halfway across the island to get the handbag from her home, then back towards Beth Barnard's house to the San Remo Bridge to commit suicide. To US investigators Lauren McCarthy and Stephanie Williams, who've been examining Beth's murder and Vivian's potential involvement, it defies logical explanation. If I am in a murderous, suicidal rage, I am not going to go kill someone on the opposite side of the island, drive back to my home, get my purse, then drive back to the other side of the island to kill myself. Sir, so it's a curious one. Yes, and whilst it's of interest, I don't think it's without explanation. I think there are cycles of um, wide-ranging emotions that Vivian is probably going through. And I think she may have gone back to collect possessions to think, now I've just got to get away. I don't believe she has really thought through a lot of this. I think a lot of it has been quite impulsive. She did pick up the handbag. It doesn't prevent her committing suicide, nor does it prevent her or um, make it not possible that she murdered, murdered Beth. She, everyone, we've been told close that she cared for her kids. Maybe she was going back and checking that her kids had been picked up. We don't know what frame of mind she's in. When uh, the expert from America was saying, well, you know, if you're in a murder, murderous suicide rage, I've never been in that situation before. Neither have I. Uh, well, one of the things that occurs to me, Rory, do we have uh, definitive proof that Vivian did commit suicide? No. No, all we've got is the uh, car parked where it was, her handbag in, the, in it, and um, no sight whatsoever of um, Vivian. She may be alive somewhere in the world. The police search and rescue squad today came the shoreline at San Remo for the missing woman. Police divers expected that if Vivian had jumped from the bridge, they would find her body. But despite an extensive search over several days, no trace of Vivian was ever found. The question that a lot of the people that knew Vivian had was that if she was going to go all the way back, and I, I accept what Gary said about maybe she did want to check that the kids had been picked up, but their own property backs onto a cliff and the real danger areas are around that other side near where they lived. I think one thing we, we should sort of uh, consider here is that there are no witnesses that saw her her on the bridge. There are no witnesses that saw her jump off the bridge. Sarah Yule and Gary Jubelin have worked together on murder cases and both believe that if Vivian was Beth's killer, she probably did take her life. Um, I don't think there's any evidence of another alternative. If Vivian has been the perpetrator of Beth's murder, then, you know, it, it left her with very few other choices of how she could pick up um, aspects of a normal life, including with her children. What do you think, Eric? I could see something terrible happening, which is Beth's murder. Viv in all sorts, if she's the person responsible, and what do I do? Am I going to commit suicide? She might have very well stood at the bridge from five o'clock in the morning and wondering what to do and then did it hours later. We don't know, that's that missing piece, but I think on the balance of probabilities, it's pointing, uh, pointing one way. But then, an unexpected twist to this mystery. A witness comes forward and makes an extraordinary claim. Glenda Frost, who knew and had worked closely with Vivian as a community volunteer, tells police she received a phone call at 10 o'clock on the morning after the murder. It is, she says, Vivian. With Glenda at the time is her close friend, Pam Lovett, who says she heard Glenda take the call. At that stage, we didn't know anything about what had gone on. And then about 10 o'clock, I think it was, I was washing up at the sink and the phone rang. And when Glenn picked it up, she said, oh, is that you, Viv? You know, so it was definitely her. And that was at 10 o'clock in the morning on the Tuesday. But it was just a normal conversation and it wasn't a long conversation. She was normal, 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 normal. 
Well, Glenda has never changed her story and Pam Lovett has uh, backed her to the hilt on that. Rory, how seriously did you take this phone call that Glenda said she received? Not very seriously, because the woman at the time said she didn't ask who it was. I don't think she'd had that much contact with Vivian and she thought this might, this woman might be able to help her with it. That was my understanding of it. I don't think there's been a homicide that I've been involved in my entire career when there hasn't been a sighting of someone that we know is already dead or misinformation that comes in. So it does happen and that's something that you've got to check um, to make sure that you can discount it or if you can't discount it, what weight you can place on it. A love triangle in the small community of Victoria's Phillip Island ends in a brutal murder. Beth Barnard is dead. Her presumed killer, Vivian Cameron, is missing. So what are we left with? We know Beth Barnard's killer has never been found. The question is, is there compelling evidence that Vivian is the murderer? Gary Jubelin investigated dozens of murders during his 30 years as a leading homicide detective. His verdict on Vivian Cameron? There will always be some unknowns that you can't answer. It's not a perfect science trying to solve a murder, but I think based on the information and the crime scene and the things that were found at the crime scene, there's enough information for her to be convicted beyond reasonable doubt in front of a jury. But could Vivian have committed the perfect crime? and staged her death. Valentine, you've looked at that. What do you say? I mean, everything's possible. However, if she did, she did a, a very bad job because it's a disappearance that she's trying to stage or a, a pseudo death, as they call it. She's failed. If she really wanted to make it look like she's committed suicide, why not go to the cliff? Why not park the car at the edge of the cliff? Why not leave a pile of clothing at the edge of the water? Where's the suicide note? There's nothing that points towards a pseudo-suicide or a fake suicide. And just to add to that, in terms of the suicide note, you're probably more likely to see that if it is staged because the last time I checked the research, uh, the majority of suicides do not leave a suicide note. And, and Vicky, did you ever think that it was possible Vivian would stage her disappearance? I, I think it's unlikely that she would have left her children. Uh, so I, I, I think she's dead. Tragically, Beth Barnard suffered a most horrific death and Vivian Cameron, police believe, is the only person known to have a clear motive to commit the crime. Her guilt is still to be tested, but Stephanie Williams and Lauren McCarthy believe that had Vivian faced trial, she might not have been convicted. I can't discount that, that Vivian may have done this. She may have, but I do think there's a lot that a defense attorney could work with. She'd have to be found guilty here, at least, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, and I think there's lots of doubt. And the biggest doubts for you are what? I think that the evidence about Vivian's plans for her marriage and leaving it and leaving with the children, that didn't ring true to me. I do think that it would be very difficult for a prosecutor to say that Vivian had done this. I think the investigation still has many stones left unturned, and I think it's a solvable case. I just think people have to, to explore those. So what to believe? If we were the jury in the murder trial of Vivian Cameron, how would we judge her? Rory, you were the investigator. Would you convict Vivian? Yeah, I would. Everything at that particular time that we could do to try and uh, prove beyond reasonable doubt to a court was looked at. And uh, we believe we had the evidence at that particular stage enough to uh, have the warrant issued, just in case she was still alive. Valentine, what's your view? What's happened? Well, are you asking me as a potential member of a jury, are you, Liz? Um, uh, yes, I am. <laughs> OK. I think, um, look, at the very least, Vivian's a suspect, but uh, would, would I convict her? I think 
on the balance of probabilities, I'd say she's got a very strong, uh, a very strong prima facie case to answer. And uh, if she didn't come up with a very good explanation, I'd be convicting her. And as a policeman? I'd be charging her. Vicky, you've wanted to give Vivian a voice in all of this. You're on the jury. What do you decide? Uh, they shouldn't let me on the jury, but uh, if Vivian was in court and she said, I'm not going to make any comment, I'm not going to make any statement, I, I, think, I think that there's enough questions that people would say, yeah, I think there's a reasonable doubt. So you would give her a not guilty? Yes. For the people of Phillip Island, this was a devastating crime that ended in the loss of two women's lives in appalling circumstances. A murder that continues to haunt them. Sarah, what do you feel for Vivian and Beth having listened to what they both have experienced? Well, I think, you know, uh, I can feel empathy for Vivian's situation and we can only speculate about what she might have been going through. Obviously, Beth was a young woman. She felt she was in love. Uh, Fergus was the one who had a commitment to Vivian. I have strong empathy for Beth. This should never have happened to her, um, whoever was the perpetrator. Um, but how this could have got to this extreme and how something has been experienced by many people in relationships. Um, but what was it? about these particular triggers and this particular person that caused it to result in this way and, and only the perpetrator can know that. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.